everybody. How are we doing? All right. Uh, before we get started with our next speaker, I did want to thank all of you again for coming and supporting Skepticon. We talk a lot uh, with um, all weekend with the speakers on building a community and making it what you want it to be. And all of you make Skepticon, and you make it so awesome. So thank everybody in this room for, for being Skepticon. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, our next speaker has won Emmys for being on the stories, as my grandma says. <laughs> um, he has a YouTube channel called Theoretical Bullshit. And <laughs> yes, and in the words of a great mind of our time, Derek Zoolander, he is really, really ridiculously good looking. <laughs> Everybody, Scott Clifton. Testing, testing. Oh, cool, it works. Hi, guys. Oh, it just got really dark. <laughs> I'm afraid of the dark. Nobody told me. Uh, okay, so I'm told that I have to click on something here, and then it makes this thing go, right? <laughs> I don't know technology. Play from start. Is that it? Yeah. Yes! <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. I'm going to stop celebrating myself. Um, uh, Wow, this is so cool. Thank you, thank you so much for having me here. This is really exciting for me. Um, there's a lot of people here that I look up to and have learned a lot from, so it's a, it's a real privilege just to be standing on this stage right now. Um, oh wait, is that working? I'm supposed to be able to click this, and then it does something. See, I click it, and then it does something. <laughs> it's, it, it, it doesn't do something when I click it. <laughs> yeah, space bar. Not the click, it's the space bar. OK. I'm learning. I'm sorry, I'm learning. Um, OK, so I'm, I'm going to be talking about something that has been kind of rolling around in my head for a while now. And it's really a, a combination of a few different ideas, a lot of which uh, have been proffered before by people a whole lot smarter than I. Uh, but then there are a couple of things I'm going to be saying that, that I uh, haven't heard before and haven't said before. Uh, and so basically, I haven't gotten feedback on this. Um, so I, I hope you. I hope you know that there's a, a, a tentativeness lurking over the shoulder of my bravado. Um, I also want to say that, that while the case I'm going to be making is philosophical in nature, uh, it, it does pertain largely to science. And as a high school dropout, um, I, I want to express my humility in this area and, and invite anyone who catches me saying something false to please, please come up and find me afterwards and correct me. OK, well, I've gotten my disclaimers out of the way. That's good. Uh, I want to I talk to you today about words. Um, not words in general, not linguistics or anything like that, but uh, a couple of very specific words and, and how it is I think we're misusing them. Um, because I, I think that sometimes we trick ourselves with the language we use. And, and in doing so, we make certain conversations, important conversations, a lot harder to have. Because uh, here we are, a bunch of skeptics hanging out, uh, a bunch of people who value critical thinking, who value science, who value intellectual prudence. Uh, and we get together at events like this, and we, and we sort of worry out loud with one another in our own ways uh, about the majority of people in the world who don't appear to value these things, at least not judging based on the kinds of claims they make about reality, the reasons they give for believing these claims, how they let these claims inform their politics and their ethics and their behavior and so forth. Uh, something like 74% of Americans believe that the universe was somehow willed into existence by an infinitely powerful, oddly opinionated, uh, disembodied consciousness that exists in some non-physical dimension of reality. 68% believe that we'll get to see this dimension of reality, but only after we die. 42% believe that dead people can come back from this dimension and haunt us. Uh, and, and just about everyone you run into, it feels like, thinks that science can have nothing to say about any of this. Uh, and so one of the things that we do at events like this is we strategize, right? How do we deal with this? How do we, how do we have this global conversation? Because make no mistake, the, the problem is not just people believing absurd or dangerous claims. We can deal with that. The problem is that as a society, we give one another permission to categorize certain absurd or dangerous claims in ways that immunize them from the scrutiny they deserve. And so 
I want to address the relationship between science and the supernatural. Actually, no, I want to address the way we address the relationship between science and the supernatural. Because I think that we're looking at it the wrong way. I think we're making a philosophical mistake and it's costing us. Now, the, the conventional wisdom is that science, almost by definition, is, is only applicable to the natural, physical universe. And this is not true merely in practice because of the limitations on what we can observe and test, but in principle as well. Uh, uh, science only makes sense when you assume that there are predictable, natural laws according to which things consistently behave, and, and the supernatural just doesn't work that way in theory. This is not to say that, that science can't test any religious claim, by the way. I mean, there's no scientific doubt, for example, that the creation story in Genesis is not literally true, but that's only because this is a testable claim about what actually happened in the natural world. Uh, nor is it to say that, that science and supernatural claims are intrinsically at odds either. I mean, even most theologians worth paying attention to nowadays will tell you that science and the supernatural complement one another, albeit in a, in a like you stay on your side of the line and I'll stay on my side of the line kind of way. Like how the police department and the fire department work together but don't call the police department if there's a fire and don't call the fire department if there's a robbery. <laughs> um, the, uh, the Christian philosopher and, and uh, apologist William Lane Craig, with whom you may be familiar, uh, puts it this way. Science, quote, science encounters metaphysical problems which religion can help to solve. Science has an insatiable thirst for explanation, but eventually science reaches the limits of its explanatory ability. For example, in explaining why various things in the universe exist, science ultimately confronts the question of why the universe itself exists. Here, theology can help. Traditional theists conceive of God as a necessary being whose non-existence is impossible, who is the creator of the contingent world of space and time. Thus, the person who believes in God has the resources to slake science's thirst for ultimate explanation, end quote. Now, <laughs> oh my god, you guys are booing. Um, uh, now, to my ear, this, this sounds a lot like saying that drinking water from the ocean can slake your thirst for water, but you get the idea. Um, and it, it's, it's easy to imagine why religion would have a vested interest in, in erecting a wall of separation between science and the supernatural. What surprises me is how rarely secularists and even scientists uh, challenge this paradigm. Uh, here, here's, here's the National Academy of Sciences. Quote, religions and science answer different questions about the world. Whether there is a purpose to the universe or a purpose for human existence are not questions for science. Science is a way of knowing about the natural world. It's limited to explaining the natural world through natural causes. Science can say nothing about the supernatural. Whether God exists or not is a question about which science is neutral." End quote. Here's another one. Quote, because science is limited to explaining the natural world by means of natural processes, it cannot use supernatural causation in its explanations. And similarly, science is precluded from making statements about supernatural forces because these are outside its provenance. This is the National Academy of Sciences. Now, it seems to me that this must be a diplomatic move. And, and despite the fact that there are no shortage of scientists who thankfully disagree with this, uh, it may even be a smart diplomatic move insofar as you don't want a very powerful religious majority to see science as a threat to their most cherished beliefs. You, you want them to welcome it, to be enthusiastic about it, to support funding for it. Uh, and in fact, this, this may be the reason that scientific theories like evolution and the Big Bang are so much more digestible to religious people than they used to be because you're constantly hearing scientists hammer home that this isn't a problem for you. God still could have been behind all of this. There's no, there's no conflict here. Don't worry. Chill out. Suck on this. <laughs> uh, so, so, so I'm not here to argue that this assumption isn't useful politically. Uh, just that it's false and, and that we shouldn't be afraid to point out that it's false in conversation. Um, I'm also not saying that we should apply or that we can apply every aspect of the scientific method 
to the supernatural. I'm not saying you can pour God into a beaker, stick it in a centrifuge and see what comes out. Uh, there are supernatural claims for which we can't create controlled environments and run replicable experiments. Then again, there are also natural claims like this too. But this is, um, this is just a practical limitation. And I'm, and I'm speaking more broadly than that. Uh, I'm speaking about the spirit of scientific thinking, making observations about the world around us, considering certain hypotheses, asking ourselves what those hypotheses predict. What, what should we expect to see or find if this is the case? I'm speaking about scientific values like parsimony, falsifiability, controlling for our own biases. There is no claim about God or the supernatural that isn't a scientific hypothesis in principle. Take the claim that the universe was designed by an infinitely powerful, perfectly intelligent designer for the sake of human life and human procreation. Is this a hypothesis that makes predictions about what we should expect to observe in the world? Yes, yes thank you. Who said yes? I love you. Uh, uh, yes, of, cor of, of course it is. It predicts that we should see perfectly intelligent design. But we don't see perfectly intelligent design. We don't even see good design. This isn't, by the way, this is not a subjective personal opinion. There are objective scientific facts to be known and learned about what good design entails. This is actually something that my wife went to school for and now does for a living. And I can tell you, the universe would look a whole lot different if God had hired my wife as a consultant. That goes for every husband. <laughs> uh, he's not wrong. And but the, but the thing is, though, when, when you point this out to someone arguing for the existence of an intelligent designer, what, what often happens is they begin to rationalize ad hoc. That is to say that they begin reasoning backwards, making up after-the-fact explanations for why we don't observe what the hypothesis predicted we, sh predicted we should observe. And, and, and the only reason for doing this is to rescue the hypothesis from being falsified. This is, of course, poor reasoning and it wouldn't survive peer review. But am I, am I begging the question here? I mean, why, why should we scrutinize a claim about the supernatural the way we scrutinize a scientific hypothesis? I mean, why should it have to pass the same kind of tests of credulity? I mean, it's a different kind of claim, right? Well, yeah. It's a different kind of claim in a lot of ways, but then Claims about geology and claims about medicine are different kinds of claims in a lot of ways. But that's kind of a red herring, isn't it? That's not really the point. The only question is, is it a different kind of claim in any way that means we cannot make predictions about what we should expect to see if it is true and test those predictions? Now you can say no. 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 No, uh, no it's not a different kind of claim in that way. And that means it is in principle a scientific claim. But let's, uh, let's play around with this a little bit, see where it takes us. What if, we, mm, what if we hypothesize that we were intelligently designed not by a god, but by an unfathomably advanced, maximally intelligent, supremely powerful alien race for the same reason that most people believe God designed us? Is that a non-scientific hypothesis? No. It's precisely a scientific hypothesis, and we can subject it to the same scientific scrutiny. What if, what if somebody said, well, no, 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 so what? I mean, it, what, what, so what if upon closer in inspection, our design is in fact terrible? That, that doesn't prove we weren't designed. I mean, maybe the aliens designed us terribly on purpose. Maybe that's the point. Would that survive peer review? No because now you've just forfeited that initial observation about the world that prompted you to make the hypothesis in the first place. So, so what, you hypothesized that we were designed intelligently in order to explain the fact that we have the appearance of being designed unintelligently? I don't think so. Is it still possible that we were designed with the appearance of being undesigned by some superior alien race? Can science prove this isn't the case? No, of course it can't. But that's not how science works. That's not science's job. In fact, the job of science is not to prove or disprove anything. Scientists walk around hammering this point home that science is not about proof. 
science is about constructing a model of reality that best accounts for all the data we have available to us while making the fewest assumptions possible. That's it. So, so try and experiment next time you're at a party. This will be fun. Uh, tell everyone who will listen that you are convinced that we are all living inside the matrix. <laughs> you're convinced. You know this. And when someone asks you what reasons you have for thinking this is true, well, tell them that science can't disprove it. And then observe what happens. You will immediately begin to pay a social price for this. <laughs> People will begin to take you less seriously. Then wait until the next party and run a different experiment. This time, instead of the matrix, tell everyone how convinced you are that God exists and that you're going to heaven when you die and that science can't prove this isn't the case. And then notice that you pay absolutely no social price for this whatsoever. Nobody even blinks. Unless, of course, you happen to be at a Skepticon after party. <laughs> but this, but this, is, this is the problem, because both of those interactions should end the same way. And the reason they don't is because so many people view the second claim as more privileged than the first. But maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm still missing something. Maybe, maybe there's still something about supernatural claims that prevents us from applying scientific thinking and scientific values. So what, what could that be? Um, one possible objection is that with the supernatural as opposed to the natural, we just don't know what we should expect to see if a given hypothesis is true. Right? In other words, there's a, there's a crucial step to the scientific method that can't be performed with respect to things like God or souls or the afterlife because science itself can't tell us whether we're actually making the right predictions based on the hypothesis. Well, the response to this is pretty simple. Yes, that's true. But the catch is that it's no more true of the supernatural than the natural. This is always a major concern when doing science. You always have to make sure you get this part right. And it's got nothing to do with the metaphysical content of the hypothesis. If I, if I hypothesize that the dent in my car is from a runaway shopping cart, and I predict that if this hypothesis is true, I should expect to find the words, Albertson was here, etched into the paint, well, I've done a bad job of deriving a prediction from my hypothesis, haven't I? Th there is no official scientific protocol that can tell you what the right scientific predictions are. By necessity, that step in the scientific method has to be some combination of logic, uh, reasoning, prior information, intuition, and other philosophical tools. And if you think that this makes it unscientific, then I got news for you. Science is a philosophy. You cannot do science without also doing philosophy. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, OK, what, what about the objection? This is my faith. Um, what about the objection that it would be arrogant of us to presume that we can make predictions about the actions or choices of a being as mysterious and inconceivable as God? Well, that doesn't work either for a couple of reasons. First, let's be clear that science makes predictions about the behavior and decisions of conscious beings all the time. We do this in sociology, psychology, criminology, economics, game theory, the list goes on. Secondly, and this is, this is a huge assumption that isn't challenged nearly enough in my opinion, why in the world should we think that a being who is omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly loving, perfectly rational and unchanging would be less predictable than a human being and not more predictable, way more predictable. Can anyone tell me this? Because I hear uh, this over and over and I just cannot make sense of it. There are an infinite number of ways to be irrational. There's only one way to be perfectly rational. There are an infinite number of ways to change. There's only one way to be unchanging. The mystery pertaining to God is not about, sorry, the mystery pertaining to God is about how he could exist and work and function and make things happen with his mind, but it's not about what God should be reasonably expected to do. And in any case, I, I find that this claim is often predicated upon a double standard because 
The same people who will deride you for daring to predict the will of God are usually the same people who, in the very next breath, will tell you with unfailing certainty exactly what God wants or what God would never, ever do. Um, but don't get cocky, guys. Because uh, I don't think this is the only double standard at play, and I don't think the religious are the only ones guilty of it. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to reread you uh, part of the statement from the National Academy of Sciences uh, I read earlier. Quote, religions and science answer different questions about the world. Whether there is a purpose to the universe or a purpose for human existence are not questions for science. End quote. Now, I think this, this is not only false, but demonstrably false. Run a quick thought experiment with me here. Um, there's this concept in inflationary theory proposed by uh, theoretical physicist Alan Guth uh, called a, a pocket universe. Um, and, and this concept sort of gets hijacked uh, all the time in science fiction and distorted to mean an entire universe, uh, stars, planets, galaxies, the whole shebang, uh, that exists inside a tiny, artificially created orb the size of a marble. You ever seen like Men in Black? It's in Men in Black. Um, you, you, could, you could hold this whole universe in the palm of your hand, and the inhabitants of this universe would have no clue how tiny and insignificant they really are. Well, what if it, what if it turns out that our universe is actually just such a thing? That the entire cosmos as we know it is, is an artificial creation, a science project, inside another universe that is very different from our own. Very different. Different laws, different constants, different spatial and temporal dimensions. So different, we wouldn't even recognize it. It would, it would seem like magic to us. And suppose we were created by the inhabitants of this larger universe for some purpose or another. Is there any doubt that the National Academy of Sciences would regard this as a scientific claim, however implausible? Is it even conceivable that they would say, oh, no, no, that's not a question for science? Of course not. It's precisely a question for science. Clearly, what makes the idea of God so scientifically untouchable is not that he created us for a purpose. It's not that he exists outside of or prior to the universe. It's not even that he resides in a world that would be unrecognizable to us or that he has capabilities that are beyond the comprehension of our primate brains. Is it that, is it that God and heaven and souls and angels are, are simply non-physical? Is that it? Not made of matter and energy like everything else we can observe? I don't think so. Just because they aren't this kind of stuff doesn't mean they aren't some kind of stuff. They're not nothing, so they're something. And as I've already argued, there is nothing about this something that is immune to scientific thinking and scientific values. So what's the difference? Because we have to figure it out. I mean, we, we, we have to pinpoint the thing that is doing the work of making God and other supernatural claims off limits. Could it be that what's doing the work is actually just a trick of language? Here's my pitch. You ready? If you believe in God, if we are assuming that something like God exists, then we are misusing words like nature and natural. Or at least we're using them misleadingly. Because I think that might actually be what this is all really about. The National Academy of Sciences might object that, that even if our universe is just a confection inside another universe. That universe, however, however foreign and unrecognizable, is still natural, whereas God is not. God is supernatural. But that, that's the rub. Try on for a moment what a belief in God really entails about reality. Try, imagine if this really were true. Well, it means that the most basic fundamental, unaltered state of reality, the default state of reality, before anything gets created, before anything happens, is that there is this being that just exists 
for no reason and with no cause. No reason because there's, there's nothing else available to have a reason for its existence. No cause because there's nothing to do the causing. This being is just there, naturally. Not supernaturally. The prefix super means, aha, the prefix super means above or beyond. But in this case, there, there's nothing else to be above or beyond. If this being really exists, our universe is not the thing that's natural. In fact, if anything, we would be decidedly unnatural. We're contrived. We're created. We're manufactured, artificial. Whatever reality God finds himself in, that is the natural world. So, so I think this, this age-old paradigm of, of natural over here versus supernatural over there only serves to confuse us. The word supernatural is really a misnomer. There is no space in which we can map that word onto reality in a way that will actually make sense. There is no beyond natural. That's incoherent. Whatever it goes further than natural is just more natural. But language tailors our thinking. And it often is how we allow ourselves to conceptualize something. And, and I actually happen to think that this particular point of confusion is effectively the, the Berlin Wall between science and religion. And once we tear down this wall, we'll begin to realize that this, this default world, the world God finds himself in, must itself be governed by predictable natural laws. Now, this is where someone religious gets very uncomfortable. Uh, but if you don't believe me, ask yourself this. How is it that God willing something to happen works? Why is God's will effective? This is an important question because, because if you believe in God, you believe that whenever God wills something to happen, that thing happens without fail. It doesn't happen in some instances and not others. It doesn't partially happen. The natural state of reality that God finds himself in consistently and predictably behaves in this way. Remind you of something? Now, this is a subject that, that in my experience most uh, theists do not want to think too hard about. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing the kind of resistance you get when you start asking questions like this. And, and usually the first reaction is something like, I, I, don't, I, don't, I'm, I don't understand what you mean. I mean, it's not, it's not a law. It's, it's, God is omnipotent. It's intrinsic to him. I mean, he, he can just do that because he's, like, powerful. I mean, he's, he has the power to do that. Uh, and after so many conversations, I, I've come to expect this answer, which, uh, of course, completely misses the point, that, that God's will is effective is not a description of something internal to God. It's a description of the relationship between God and the rest of reality. It's about how the world God finds himself in responds to and interacts with God. Namely, whenever God wills something to happen, that thing happens. That description right there that I just gave you is a natural law. That's all a natural law is. And if God exists, he can't be credited for that. God didn't make his will effective, since that would entail an absurd, infinite regress of willing the will to be effective, and then willing that the willing of the will to be effective is effective, and so on. So the, the, the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of God's will, I'm sorry, is above God's pay grade. It's a simple fact. It has to be a simple fact about the reality in which God finds himself. So to say that God is omnipotent doesn't really answer the question. What makes God omnipotent is these laws of nature. In exactly the same way that what makes someone able to bench 200 pounds is the laws of physics. The ability to bench 200 pounds is not some property that's intrinsic to me. It's a relationship. It seems inarguably clear that there are laws of nature which would have to be antecedent to any of God's features or abilities. And by the way, th this is just an example, this business about, about God's will. I mean, we, we could ask plenty of other questions that would deliver us to the same conclusion. I mean, why, why does God stay in existence instead of randomly ceasing to exist? 
Why does he have the traits and qualities he has instead of other traits and other qualities? And, and, and why are the traits and qualities he does have immutable? Why isn't God constantly, spontaneously changing? And, the, and by the way, the more specific the religious doctrine, the more specific the natural laws you're going to have to posit. Why did Jesus have to physically sacrifice himself to atone for the sins of the world? Was God just doing this for shits and giggles? Or, or, or is there some natural law that God just can't pardon everyone, no matter how compassionate or forgiving he feels? There has to be a sacrifice, and so on. In principle, silly as it sounds, all of these are scientific questions about nature. And this remains true no matter the degree to which we can study them in practice. Let me be clear uh, what I'm not arguing, by the way. I am not arguing that God requires a God, that these natural laws require a lawgiver of some sort, that, that we don't think this is true of the law of physics, and so there's no reason to think it would be true of these laws. Natural laws are not prescriptive. They're, they're descriptive. They're just statements. They're just observations about the way reality happens to consistently and reliably behave. And, and if it turned out that there were some deeper explanation as to why these laws are the way they are, uh, then that's a scientific question as well. And it's a question that should be just as interesting to the religious as it presently is to the secular. OK, let me see if I can uh, wrap this up in a neat little bow. Um, what, I, what I hope to have shown today is that as far as science is concerned, the distinction between the natural and the so-called supernatural, between religious claims and non-religious claims, is actually an illusion. It turns out that the moment you look closely, the distinction disappears. Everything about religious claims we can point to that is supposed to inoculate them from scientific values is either false or a misunderstanding of science or true, but no less true of other claims that we do accept as scientific. And it seems to me that when, when all is said and done, the thing about religious claims that makes us so badly want to shelter them from scientific scrutiny is not actually a fact about what those claims are. It's a fact about why we believe them. Intelligent people don't give one another permission to believe a scientific claim for bad reasons. But they do give one another the same exact permission for religious claims. And I think that we are victims of our own vocabulary. I think as a secular community, once we stop acquiescing to the language that fools us into thinking that these two things are different, we'll finally be able to have the conversation that we've needed to have for so long. Thank you.